So the title of this talk is the question, is tragic man guilty? This, of course, is a reference to Heinz Kohut's idea that whereas in the past, up until some point in the 1950s, the average patient who came for psychoanalysis um, was suffering from problems of guilt, conflicts leading to guilt, the kind of thing that Freud called moral masochism, being wrecked by success, fearing success, being a criminal out of a sense of guilt, uh, conflicts between superego, ego, and id, etc. But Kohut's idea was that since um, some point in the 1950s, a new kind of patient started showing up, uh, and these were patients who, rather than suffering from conflicts and guilt, were suffering from emptiness. Um, Eric Erickson had made the same historical observation before 1950. People came who thought that they knew who they were and who they ought to be, but couldn't manage to be it. Um, that is, they had an ego identity, they had a superego telling them who they ought to be, but they had an id full of sexual and aggressive drives that were uh, making it difficult for them to be who they knew they were and who they knew they ought to be. Okay, at some point in the 50s, this new kind of patient emerges who, rather than being conflicted, comes not knowing uh, who they are and not knowing who they ought to be. Uh, they come with problems of identity, diffusion, identity crisis, uh, these patients, in contrast to guilty man, Kohut calls tragic man. I guess the tragedy lying in their loss of identity or their unclarity in the field of identity. And he also calls these patients as sufferers from what he calls disorders of the self. At the same time, more mainstream psychoanalysts were noting the emergence of these new kinds of patients. They were calling these patients narcissistic personality disorders. Kohut didn't like uh, the term narcissistic personality disorder. He thought that uh, the term narcissism was judgmental, so he sought to replace that, that adjective with, with a new term, disorders of the self, or for short, self-disorders. Okay, uh, whereas a guilty man suffers from guilt depression, uh, tragic man suffers from emptiness depression. Two kinds of depression. In, in, in guilty man, you have a self, but, but a self that is riddled with conflicts and guilt, a self that is full of guilt. In the case of tragic man, you have a very blurry self that rather than being filled with guilt is empty. Okay, uh, I, I've written extensively a critique of this. There's a long chapter in my 2018 book, uh, which is a critique of Kohut's thinking in this area. Uh, but today I want to simply make a shorter and simpler statement of what I see as the problem, because these many decades later, uh, it's still a problem. In fact, I'm rather astonished uh, to see um, the degree to which this distinction between guilty man and tragic man, or this distinction between guilt depression and emptiness depression has taken hold of the field. Not so much among, among Freudians, not so much among Freudian ego psychologists, not so much among Kleinians. Freudians and Kleinians uh, still understand um, 
the role of guilt uh, in psychopathology. But certainly among that broad group of people who belong to what may be called uh, the relational turn in psychoanalysis, not just self-psychology, but relational psychoanalysis. I mean, Stephen Mitchell, Lewis Aron, Adrian Harris, um, that group of relational psychoanalysts, certainly also among what came to be called intersubjectivity theory, Stollero, Atwood, Brandshaft, those many people. Um, I'm, I'm not talking about so-called object relations theory, uh, which is an ambiguous field. Um, classic object relations theory is Melanie Klein, and certainly the Kleinians never lost sight of the role of internal conflict and the dynamics of guilt and self-punishment and self-persecution. They never lost sight of the role of persecutory guilt in psychopathology. But there's that other branch of object relations theory reflecting middle group thinking um, in terms of the three groups in the British society, um, much closer to relational psychoanalysis. Um, I'm thinking not so much of Fairbairn. I mean, Fairbairn recognized the role of the internal saboteur, which is just uh, another, which is just a, another name for the Freudian superego. He also saw the role of what he called the anti-libidinal ego. So certainly Fairbairn and, and his followers, many of his followers, did not lose sight of the dynamics of uh, internal persecutory uh, self-attacking mechanisms, superego attack, guilt. Um, one of his followers, one of Fairbairn's followers certainly did lose sight of that, and that is Harry Guntrip. Um, he was analyzed by Fairbairn. I think Fairbairn kept trying to talk to Harry about the role of aggression and self-persecution. Harry wasn't able to hear this. His second analyst, Winnicott, um, seemed to confirm this element, this relational element in Guntrip's thinking. And so Guntrip basically went off in the direction of self and relational psychoanalysis. And certainly in his essay on his two analyses, his two personal analyses with Fairbairn and Winnicott, um, he certainly never came to understand the role of self-punishment and self-attack in his own what he called his exhaustion illnesses. He thought that his exhaustion illnesses reflected a deficit, uh, not good enough mothering, uh, which left him empty. Um, he suffered from a kind of a basic fault, uh, a basic deprivation, a kind of traumatic deprivation I mean, he complained that neither Fairbairn nor Winnicott were able to really cure him. Of course, Harry uh, had to be the only one who could cure Harry. Um, uh, there have been a number of papers written about this characteristic of narcissistic uh, individuals. Um, they don't really allow themselves to be analyzed. They conduct a self-analysis in the presence of the analyst only Harry could cure Harry. Um, and so he departs really from Fairbairn uh, and moves in the direction of self and relational theory. He moves away from guilty man uh, towards tragic man, uh, emptiness depression. And he was convinced that his emptiness depression was a direct result of having been left empty of mother love. He walked in and saw his brother Percy dead in his mother's lap. He blamed the coldness of the mother for Percy's death. And to the end of his life, it never occurred to him that his need to be dead in his exhaustion illness, like his brother Percy, might have had something to do with guilt 
around the fantasy of having killed his brother. Juliet Mitchell says, where there are siblings, murder is in the air. When a sibling dies, uh, the surviving siblings often feel they have blood on their hands. Uh, but this never occurred to Harry, no. Uh, he was not a sufferer from guilt. He was simply empty because of the coldness of his mother. So this idea of pathology as rooted in the cold mother, the dead mother, um, the narcissistic mother, the depressed mother, the mother who can't mother, the mother who doesn't provide the primary love necessary to really establish a viable self. This idea is rampant in contemporary psychoanalysis, at least among the self in relational schools, less so among Freudians and Kleinians. Okay, I think it's all wrong. I think it's terribly naive. Um, but it reflects uh, a simple kind of binary thinking. People who could not accept Freudian drive theory, the idea that we come into the world with an id full of antisocial, sexual, and aggressive drives, people who reject that, as I reject that, as I have always rejected that, but people think that if they're going to reject the biologically based drives as the root of the human problem, they must therefore swing radically away from nature to a very one-sided nurture theory, from biologism to environmentalism. And so if our problems are not rooted in our drives, then they must be rooted in environmental failure, such people think. And the first environment is the mother. So it must be maternal failure. More sociologically oriented people might stretch that out to include societal failure, familial fa failure, failure of the father. But it's always some kind of parental failure to provide. And so the poor patient is missing something essential to life. It's an absence, it's an emptiness, because mother, father, the environment failed to provide that primary love, that primary nurturance, and this is the root of the psychopathology. But the facts don't support this. As I said in another recent video called The Sins of the Fathers, the embarrassing fact, the inconvenient fact is that good parents often have bad children. And bad parents often have good children. Now, I'm not saying that parenting, the quality of the parenting doesn't matter. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the quality of the parenting is one small piece of a very complicated story. And of course, both schools, you know, all, practically all schools of psychoanalytic thought, let's even take the biological, uh, the people who emphasize the biologically, somatically ba based drives of sex and aggression as a part of the problem. Uh, they're determinists. Uh, then the people who swing to the nurture side, all our problems are due to inadequate provision. Well, they're also determinists. Where is existentialism? Where is the idea that there is some role for freedom and choice? Some people make bad choices and they go down a bad path and their lives get worse and worse. Some people make good choices and they go down a good path and their lives get better and better. Very little attention to this in psychoanalytic thought. We have biological determinism, we have environmental determinism, but we sure don't have much role for choice, for freedom, and for responsibility. But in addition to freedom and responsibility, there is, of course, constitution. 
hereditary factors, which no doubt play some role. I'm not big on biology and I have zero interest in brain science, but we are animals, we are bodies, and we come into the world with different temperaments. Uh, of course, there's environmental influence even while the baby is still in the womb. I'm not ignoring that. Um, but biology and constitution and heredity have to play some role. I think that role is greatly exaggerated in biological psychiatry, but I don't want to swing to the other extreme and ignore it altogether. Some role for biological factors, some role for the parenting, uh, some role uh, for freedom and choices and responsibility. In any case, even today in psychoanalysis, so many therapists are working on the assumption that psychopathology is rooted in some kind of deprivation or trauma. Of course, today, trauma is all the rage. Um, everything is rooted in trauma. Uh, and I would never ignore the importance of trauma. Trauma is real. But what are people not looking at? What do they not want to emphasize? Namely, that trauma generates aggression, anger, and rage. As I say, we're animals. You frustrate an animal, it snarls. If you poke it with a stick, it may leap at you and bite you. Trauma generates rage. What happens to the rage? It gets turned on the self. What do we call that? Superego. That is what superego is. It is id aggression turned away from the object and back against the self. And now you are beating yourself, attacking yourself the way you would like to have attacked those who traumatized you or allowed you to be traumatized. The way you would like to have attacked the people who deprived you. But no. You've turned the aggression on yourself. And on the outside, what does it look like? It looks like an emptiness. It looks like a nothing. It looks like a crater. But nobody asks what produced the crater. A bomb produced the crater. The self has been annihilated. It is empty because it has been annihilated because it has been attacked, devastated. And so you see an emptiness. But what you don't see is what causes the emptiness, which is the superego, the internal, hostile, persecutory, sadistic, attacking superego, which represents the rage resulting from trauma turned back against the self. But this rage is not seen. It's, it, 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 it's always struck me as like one of those cowboy movies. The camera opens on the desert and, and there's a, uh, a wagon train and the wagon is on its side and one of the wagon wheels is turning slowly. It has arrows in it. And then there are bodies lying around uh, with arrows in them. Uh, so we see the results of devastation, but we, we didn't see the actual attack. We're just looking at the results of the attack. Emptiness depression is the result of an attack. It is not a direct result of a failure of provision. I'm not denying the failure of provision. Very often there has been a real failure of provision. But that is not what has created, had not directly created the emptiness. The failure, the trauma, the deprivation has produced rage. And rage has been taken over by the superego and turned against the self. And there is an ongoing attack. Okay. We 
in, in, in large sectors of contemporary psychoanalysis, we have lost touch with the role of the superego in pathological narcissism or in disorders of the self. Uh, the therapy then becomes entirely a matter of provision. The therapist, patient suffers from an emptiness, therapist is going to provide warmth, empathy, self-object function, holding, containment. Heinz Kohut, with one terribly deprived woman, she needed to be held. He extended one finger. And then I always wonder, where is that finger going to go next? If the patient suffers from a hole in the self and the therapist must heal through provision, how far is this provision going to go? I think this theory has gotten a lot of therapists into trouble. I'm not saying it always leads to that trouble, but it sure, it sure doesn't help. It sure doesn't help. The patient isn't getting better. The patient is trying to convince you that all your efforts to provide have failed, that there's still this emptiness, but look, that can lead to real trouble. Uh, but of course, I'm not complaining against this theory because it can lead to trouble. No, I'm complaining about it because it isn't true, because it is blind to the role of self-directed aggression in narcissistic conditions. Certainly in America, the idea that narcissism, that narcissistic disorders are centrally involved with the superego is an idea that has largely been lost. Okay, the superego, the hostile sadistic superego. Remember, the core of the superego for Freud is id aggression turned on the self. Then secondarily, it's the internalization of the culture. But the core is aggression turned on the self, which is why Freud himself in, in, in his late paper called for the demolition of the superego. He saw that the superego is the core of psychopathology. Ferenczi agreed. Franz Alexander agreed. They called for the complete elimination of the superego. I've come to the view that that's impossible. We need a superego. We need to know the rules. But the superego has to be subordinated to what I call the conscience, because a lot of the rules are immoral, especially in racist and sexist and heterosexist societies where the rules are themselves immoral. The superego needs to be disciplined by the conscience. People follow James Strachey. No, we don't want to eliminate the superego. We just want to modify it. How do you know in what direction to modify it? That For that, you need a moral compass, which is what I call the conscience. In any case, I'm talking about the role of the superego in narcissistic conditions. Simple. Narcissists on some deep unconscious level hate themselves, they consider themselves worthless. And as a defense against this painful sense of worthlessness, they generate a grandiose self. Uh, but that sense of worthlessness is already the result of an attack. Something in that person is saying you are worthless, you are a worm, you're a zero. And so now they have to prop themselves up because if they succumb to this idea that they are a zero, they're going to have to kill themselves. And so, so it must be warded off. And so it's warded off with a bunch of defenses and those defenses result in what we call narcissistic personality disorder. They're so busy warding off their self-hate, they can't love. They can't recognize the reality of other people. They can't develop a capacity for concern. They're too busy avoiding suicide by shoring themselves up. And why do they need shoring up? Because they have an attacking superego that is telling them they are zero. How many therapists in North America understand 
that narcissism is all about this hostile superego. That's an insight that has been widely lost sight of. Okay.